Hey. hey. It always takes it longer than we feel like it should. I know every time we come on, we're like, oh, finally it started. I'm always afraid it won't. Hi. Hi. Welcome to the February 2021 Ask Us Anything Live Q&A. As you can tell, I have a puppy here and I have her food in my pocket. And she knows it. Which is why I have on this very, very sexy vest. So I apologize for that. I hope wherever you are that you are staying warm. I know there are huge parts of the U.S. right now that are very, very cold and having issues with power. Oh my God, what's going on in Texas right, right now? Right, exactly. Off. It's a challenge, it definitely. Indeed. So I hope that you're warm wherever you are. And um, if you're watching this on replay, I hope that you're doing really well. Um, we have some interesting topics. Again, this month I got questions that I was like, I have no idea. Let me look it up. So um, that's always fun for me. Did you want to start or did you want me to start? Uh, well, I can start with this one about superfoods. And it's an interesting article I saw um, by... Um, Gregor? No. Um, I'm going to guess. Hold on. The Mc, original. McDougal? No. Oh, call, e. Call, yeah, e? yeah. What's his? What's T. His? Colin Campbell. All right. What's their... Uh, Forks over knives. No. The, the Center for... Oh, the Center for Nutritional yes. Studies. And they talked about uh, superfoods and is it dangerous. And so their, their, t their take is very interesting because they talk about um, how superfoods in themselves are not a bad thing. I mean, they're superfoods. What honestly. does it mean dangerous? Dangerous in the sense that are we complacent and, and don't worry about how we eat, generally speaking, because we eat superfoods. Oh, so okay. So if you eat like kale, then don't worry about the, you know, tons of cheese you eat because kale is a superfood. And, and I just use those two examples, but, but basically it's anything along those lines that people tend to think that, oh, if I'm eating the superfoods then I can eat the other stuff and it's okay. Uh, and they, they particularly, and I know you're gonna like this, uh, talk about eggs as an example. Uh, and so I'm gonna have to look at my notes because you know how I am with this. I have notes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, so, eggs claim, of course, is that it's got uh, many nutrients, high quality protein, and potent antioxidants. That's what eggs claim. That's what eggs claim. Okay. And so the issues, the issues that come up with something like that, just using eggs as a superfood, because they claim that they're a superfood. Even though they're not. Right, is that without direct comparison, eggs to any other food or combination of foods, the claim of nutrient richness says very little. So their nutrient rich richness compared to what? Right, you know, a, Valid. a piece of concrete. I mean, I don't That's know. That's true, yeah. You know, they're not really, they don't really do that. Better for you than concrete. All right. It says the claim that eggs are loaded with high quality protein is provided with even less context. So they basically talk about in the article, um, it says nothing about how or why protein, proteins of eggs should be regarded as high quality protein. Um, hmm. Then the protein provided by other foods, so plants, in our case, it would be plants. Mm -hmm. It also says nothing about the history of measuring protein, which, I know you're going to be shocked about this, uh, protein quality, which has long been biased towards animal protein. And yeah, they, we've talked about that before, that when they talk about high quality, they're, they're talking about animal protein, that, that, that that's not the, you know, not the same thing, that they don't have, their comparison data isn't good. They don't have convincing justification to use that as right. an example. Mm -hmm. um, they, they talk about... Um, the antioxidants, antioxidants, I can say that word, content, which implies eggs are good for your eyes. Um, but it doesn't mention that many foods provide far more of these antioxidants that are great for your eyes. So mm -hmm. it's like there's this, there's this you know, minutia of, uh, mm -hmm. not minutia, that's the wrong word. No, it's right, a small oh, amount, yeah. Okay, of, of um, antioxidant that... You know, I guess if you eat 3,000 eggs and don't die from uh, high cholesterol, and, and you know, you might be able to get enough. I don't know. I'm using, that's my example, not theirs. Uh, and, and it tries to debunk that eggs are high in cholesterol content by providing two sources which prior connections to the animal foods industry. Now, interesting, this article they're talking about for eggs was actually put out by, health, by Healthline. Oh. And so the interesting about that, of course, is a lot of people probably think Healthline is a good source for nutritional information. Mm -hmm. But like a lot of these um, publications out there, is it really depends on who's sponsoring them. Right. Like, who's paying for mm -hmm. this article to be put out there? And believe me, they are paying for it. Right, always. Uh, let me see if I have anything else on that. Oh. You know, it goes back to the point about look out for marketing. Because they can, there's a lot of things that they can say in marketing and with no comparative data, 
Right. Who knows? And the article does talk about how the superfood industry has, has opened up great opportunities for marketers mm. to use these terms, which again aren't really regulated, mm -hmm. um, to manipulate people. That's um, unfortunate. And back to the problem with superfoods is it doesn't do enough to provoke broad dietary change. When I talked about this, it might even encourage compliance, complacency, mm -hmm. by giving consumers a false sense of security. So you're, you're eating this superfood, and therefore you should be okay with the other ones. Um, and, it talk, and the other issue it talks about is that it allows consumers to focus on individual foods instead of nutrition as a whole. Yeah, individual nutrients, yeah. Um, so are, are eggs like self-proclaimed superfood? Like they've yes. given themselves that label? Yes, yes. Fabulous. And that article Healthline talks about it being that as well. Oh, really? Kind of scary. Interesting, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, and the other problem with superfoods is it, it has the... What's the word I want to use here? It, it, it shows people's want and need to find a magic bullet. Right, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. there's got to be a magic bullet that'll help me. It's like why, why vitamins and, and supplements are so popular in this country because everybody wants that magic bullet. And it then talks about how we should lean towards a health food we enjoy. So it talks about how, and it uses an example as kale. Not everybody likes kale. So the, I can't eat it. I was so can, sad. Yes, exactly. It bothers my stomach. But, but a lot of people will take the attitude where since they don't like kale, then they might as well not eat anything that's healthy because they kale's don't like one kale? Thing. Well, because kale is the one thing you have to eat if you want to be healthy. Oh, okay. And what the article talks about is that eat the healthy foods that you like the way they taste. Mm. You know, and enjoy. Eat those foods. You don't have to eat kale if you don't like it. Right. Makes sense. Uh, anything else? And then it talks about, and this is also very important, it also talks about how there's a perception I don't know if it's around the world, but certainly there is in this country, and we've run into it often, is that it costs too much to eat healthy. Mm -hmm. And then it talks about how, you know, beans aren't expensive, potatoes aren't expensive, you know, um, you know, rice, rice and there's a lot um, of bean, Even beans? Uh, quinoa is quinoa. not, is pretty right. cheap. Right, there's a lot of food that's really, really healthy for you and, and will provide a really great nutritional basis, I guess, mm -hmm. um, that... I mean, as we have said, since we turned plant-based, we didn't spend nearly as much on food as we used to. Our budget went down by a third. Right, exactly. Yeah. So that's what I have on superfoods and the danger of, of, you know, thinking of them in terms of... Well, they're becoming marketing rather becoming than marketing, a real yeah, thing. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you and I don't even focus on... Because I've been asked that. I've, I've been asked for, you know, for articles. Can you comment on superfoods? And it's like, no, not really, because they're not like they're food and they're good for you and sure they have nutrients, but what makes them super? Right. What, did, was, was there anything in the article that gave a definition of what that word means? It, no, because it's not, it's actually not regulated. There is no. So it's not a thing. Right. It's, it's okay. people say, oh, like, and they use goji berries as an example. And we do eat goji berries, but goji berries they're are available. an additional cost. Yeah. Do you need to eat go goji berries? You do not need to eat goji berries. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and he also talks about, the article talks about how they really have not done any studies. To talk about just eating a, a whole food, well balanced diet, and how that is better for you. Than just to eat real food. Right, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I hear you. So, well, thanks for doing that. And sure. I'm taking notes on that article. I appreciate that. All right. So on to your questions that you uh, you sent us. The first one I got. And this is one that I was like, I don't actually know. Was what is the difference between cocoa and cacao? And I was like, I don't know. And you know what's weird about that one? I don't know the answer to that, but my I just want to say what my first answer would be is the exact same thing, just pronounced differently. Well, the, the, you know what's funny about that? So, cocoa is spelled C-O-C-O-A. Cacao is spelled C-O-C-A-O. -O. So they're exactly the same except the flip-flop of one letter. But I went and did some research and I found a video, um, an interview with Dr. Michael Clapper. And what he said was that uh, cacao is from the cacao plant, which I thought it was a cocoa plant, but apparently it's a cacao plant. And the, that the seeds, the little pod things, are fermented but not heated. So the beans part are fermented but not heated. Um, on, and he says on the ground, he said, if you ever want to stop eating chocolate, go look at the process of how they, how they do this and the bugs. And then he said it's actually kind of gross. Um, he said it's very, very bitter, but it does have antioxidants in it. So that's cacao. Now, to make cocoa, you take the cacao and you roast it. So mm -hmm. then you add heat to it 
um, and it becomes um, cocoa. But in the process of being roasted and being heated, it does lose some of its nutrient value. Um, but you're not, either, you're not gonna eat either one of them for health reasons. It's not a food that you go out and say, that's a superfood, I need to get some of that. It's not a thing, it's, it's kind of, he called it a condiment. It's, he said it's something that's usually ingested with sh a lot of sugar because you have to get rid of the bitter bitterness and that's true, like chocolate is loaded with sugar. And so he said that, because he was pressed in this video, which is healthier, what should you eat? So he just said, well, the original that wasn't heated has, has more antioxidants, but not enough that you should go out on a mission to find um, it. Cacao, like it's, cacao. Yeah, the cacao. It's not, it's really not that big a thing. It's just not. So I know we had asked a question about cacao versus cocoa before, and this video was relatively new. So I wanted to um, touch on that because somebody asked again that it doesn't matter. <laughs> that, I mean, the bottom line is, the small amounts of that you're going to eat, it's not really going to make that much of a difference. So don't, you know, don't stress yourself out about it. It's a good example of superfood, right? I mean, somebody I'm, I'm imagining thinks that cacao is a superfood compared to, say, cocoa, mm -hmm. right? And as he's mentioning, that the amount of difference we're talking about nutrients is just, it's not worth even talking about. Because it's not like you're making your whole diet up of one or the other and that minutia of, um, minute a bit of, no antioxidants is going to make a difference. It's just not. It's not going to be a thing. Um, another question we got is, what are our thoughts on oil pulling? Mm -hmm. So oil pulling is when you put um, an oil, and apparently, well, I did a little bit of research on it, people are using like all kinds of different oils to do this, um, but coconut oil seems to be the most popular, and you swish it around in your mouth. There are people who claim that it helps with cavities and all these different things. You're supposed to spit it out at the end. You're not supposed to swallow it, which is ideal, I guess. Um, there's not really any scientific evidence that it's helpful. It doesn't really, there's no evidence that it does anything for you. Um, the one thing, the one caveat that I always give when somebody asks about oil pulling is if you want to put it in your mouth and swish it using your tongue and your cheek muscles, that's fine, but don't suck it through your teeth. Because if you put it, you know, between your, your cheek and your, and your teeth and then suck it like that, you're using your lungs. And doing that can cause um, aspirated drops of the oil to go into your lungs where it can cause infection. Mm -hmm. So if you can swish it without engaging your lungs, I guess fine. It, there's no real harm in it, um, except it's just not helpful, but whatever. If it has psychological benefit for you, fine. But don't suck it through your teeth because you don't want any of that aspirated oil to end up in your lungs. That's mm, definitely not. Not, not, not a good thing. Um, then I got a, a question about, so someone was talking to a friend of theirs who was saying that red wine is good for you and that study, studies show that some alcohol is better than being a teetotaler, which is drinking none. Um, you know, that, and they, that's, we've talked about it briefly before, the J curve that's in the data. And so what I explained was that, and you've heard me say this before, all alcohol is carcinogenic. It just is. It's a toxin. It's bad for your brain. You know that because it makes you drunk. This is not news. Um, if you are going to drink alcohol, red wine is the least horrible for you. Russ does drink red wine. Um, we do drink some alcohol, although I'm back to being like, I don't want to be drinking alcohol. So we, Russ, for Christmas, did buy me some of the... Um, Non-alcohol. What's it? What's it? It's like... Seedlet? No. Yeah, it is by Seedlet, but it's called the sober curious movement oh. and so there are new things out there and i guess i could show it to you yeah. <laughs> it's right here um but this is a, a non-alcoholic thing you can add it to you know tonic water or ginger ale or something this one's by seed lip and it's their uh, citrus one and, you know i kind of like it it does have a bitterness to it but so does so alcohol. alcohol and if you're so, trying to get that same flavor right, right. so um it's it's nice not cheap, but I would say, you know, if, yeah, you're if you're sober curious, give that a try. But then the question about what the, about the J curve, why does the data show that no alcohol is less healthy than a little bit of alcohol? So if you drink a little bit, you're, you, the J comes down. So health, you're, it's, it's um, a little bit more healthy than no alcohol, and then it goes to being really unhealthy. And why does it happen? And the reason that that happens is that when they look at people and ask them, do you drink? If the answer is no, they don't mean have you ever. They mean do you now. And they don't necessarily in the data specify 
when they quit drinking and how much they drank before they quit drinking. And so in their no, I don't drink people who mark that box, they include people who quit drinking because of their health. So people who have cirrhosis of the liver and major you know, alcohol in, um, cre created Alzheimer's, like all these major diseases that are caused by drinking alcohol. So they quit drinking and then they end up in a study that says, do you drink? And they say no. And then they have really bad health. Well, the reason they have bad health is because they used to. Drink, right. So unfortunately, what the studies need to ask is, have you ever been a drinker? And how much over the course of your life? Or when was the last time you had a drink? Or do you have any ailments that are... But they don't do that in yeah. the studies. Well, especially if there's been, the study's being run by the alcohol industry. So that's why you end up, if you look at just the raw data, and you'll hear people say, no, some alcohol is better than none. It's because of that J-curve. that, And that's because that people who um, quit drinking because of their health are included in non-drinkers, which they actually aren't. Um, I, so that, that's frustrating to me, but there it is. That, mm -hmm. And somebody who's arguing with you about you know, wanting to drink their wine, it's not worth trying to explain the J-curve to them. No, they're not, not going to care. They're, and yeah, well, they'll just say you're wrong. I mean, you know, right, yeah. You know, people can be when it comes to their alcohol. Yep, yep, exactly. They're not going to care. Um, another question I got was um, from somebody who was looking to add barley to their um, diet. Yeah, that's what I want to, to their to their like regimen of food that they eat. And they were asking me, is barley a good food? And you know, is it, how would they add it? So, love barley. We we do eat it quite regularly. It's on the list with kamut and all those different kind of things. Um, you can you basically cook it like rice, although it does need to be cooked longer. I tend to put it in soup, like I just throw it in soup and cook it with my beans. So that's a really easy way to eat it. The one thing that you want to look out for is that most of the brands that you're going to find in your grocery stores are going to say pearled barley. Mm -hmm. And pearled barley means um, that they have been kind of turned so that the husk, the hull on the outside has been taken off. And that's the same difference as you see with brown rice and white white rice. White rice, I can't talk. White rice has had the hull taken off. Brown rice still has it. Pearled barley, the hull has been removed, much like you'll see in white rice. So you want to look for um, just barley. If it says pearled on it, that's not the kind that you want. You want to mm -hmm. make sure that you're still getting the fiber. And remember, if it's good enough for the barley men, it's good enough for men. What is that from? Isn't that from um, the, the Greek, the... the um, Gladiators? Oh, the gladiators, yes. the barley men. I, I, right. I was like, you thought you were recording a movie. No, but barley you're right. The yeah. barley, the gar, the gladiators were called barley men because they ate so much, so much barley. barley they were yeah. mostly plant based. So yeah. Oh, and speaking of soup, I made a note on that. Um, this week I made a pea soup and black rice. I happen to have black rice, so I threw it in there. Soup. And um, as you know, if you watch me regularly, I like to put an apple or two in my soup because it, it kind of just helps sweeten it and um, make it, I don't know, I like it. I think it works really well with the flavor in most soups, most things. Well, this weekend when I went to cook, I only had one itty bitty little apple, tiny little one. So I was like, all right, so what can I do instead? And so what I ended up doing is I put in two sweet potatoes. I popped them in the microwave just long enough to make them soft enough to get the skin off of them. Then I diced them up and threw them in with the rest of the soup. And that same thing. So if you aren't a fan of apples or you're allergic to apples or you don't have apples in the house, um, adding a sweet potato or two to your soup will also do the same kind of thing, adding that um, undertone of umami and, and sweetness that is so, so good. So yeah. the soup turned out really well, although it's, it's not really soup. Yes, it's more of a stew that I it's, turn into soup. So. Yeah, you have to add water to yeah. it. It got really thick. And that's because, um, what did I put in it? Rice. Oh yeah, the black rice. The black rice soaked up all the water. So, but it's good. It is. It's really, it looks really good. tasty. Nothing wrong with the way it looks. Well, it, it is brown, but that's because so? black rice. But no. yeah, so if you have sweet potatoes, they're great in soup. I definitely recommend throw them in there, um, and they they kind of just, especially if you cook them a little bit first, they kind of disintegrate and become part of the broth, and they're super mm. super tasty. All right, is that all in that one? Yes. And the doggies back. Those are pause, you said. <laughs> All right, the next question I got was coffee and nutrient absorption. Does coffee uh, limit, inhibit, or otherwise interfere with, with nutrient absorption? So we've told you before that green tea will re reduce iron absorption um, by quite a bit, up to 90%. Um, no, I'm sorry, up to uh, 64%. And then um, I did. I saw a study that said that coffee is about 39% for iron. Iron um, deficient, uh, 
Absorption. No, absorption. Absorption. It dif it dif it lowers your iron absorption by about 20 39% uh, to drink coffee with um and then this was studying hamburger. Um instant coffee can reduce iron absorption by 60 to 90%. And it just said from bread and I'm like was it fortified bread? Yeah. What kind of bread was it? What it, so didn't and what else did they have with the bread? No data on that. Um, the stronger your coffee or tea is, the more that it will interfere with the absorption of iron. Caffeine has also been found um, to bind with only about 6% of the iron from the meal. So it's really not that much. There's something else in coffee that's causing a problem with absorption, but, you know, not that much. Um, if you, but if you drink your coffee or tea at least one hour before you eat, non-issue because it's, it's, you know, through the system. So it's a not, not a problem. Um, it has also been found that coffee can have an effect on B6, uh, calcium, and magnesium um, absorption. And it does cause more urination, which can flush water-soluble vi vitamins through your system. So if you're drinking a lot of coffee, it can flush your water-soluble vi uh, vitamins. Now, the one thing that I was looking for and couldn't find any data on is that these studies that are talking about reduced iron absorption all of them are done with animal products, and animal products have heme iron in them. Mm -hmm. um, and as you know, um, heme iron from blood can't be regulated. Your body can't regulate how much it takes in. If it's there, it just absorbs it. Whereas non-heme iron, which is what is in plants, your body can regulate it. It can say, oh, I need iron, let me have some. Oh, I don't need iron, let me not. And so if they're doing these studies with heme iron and they say it's reducing absorption, is that because, is that bad? Did the body need iron? Is it a problem that it reduced the absorption? Like, it, it, there seems to be this assumption in the data that if your body can absorb it, it should. And that's not necessarily true with iron. And so I don't think that it's a good study to, you, to study coffee with heme iron because what if your body didn't need the iron to begin with and so the fact that the coffee blocked the absorption was actually a positive thing. Right. What about, uh, did they talk about ca decaffeinated at all? No, and well they said, so the caffeine is only 6%. Oh. So there's something else in the coffee. Mm -hmm, exactly. So I'm guessing that decaf is also you know doing something. Right. But they didn't talk about, you know, is that not, does it do non-heme iron as well? I mean, the one study did say from bread, so was that, was that non-heme iron or was that fortified, fortified in some way with something with some other kind of iron? I don't even really know what they use to fortify bread, what kind of iron is in it. Know. It just says iron. Yeah, I mean, my guess would be heme iron, but what do I know? Yeah, I don't know. That's a, I don't have a pen. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Is it heme iron that they fortify bread with? Because, you know, when they fortify stuff, who knows what they put in it? So unfortunately, the data does say that coffee can reduce absorption of you know a couple of different things if you eat, if you drink it with your meal, but it's not exactly clear, especially with iron, if that's a good or a bad thing. So um, I would say, if you're if you're not iron deficient, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, I, I, same with some of the other nutrients as far as you know, B6, calcium, magnesium. We've talked about. Uh, coffee and calcium before. If you're not deficient, not a huge deal. Um, and if you are, drink your coffee in, um, an hour before you eat breakfast. Don't drink it with your food. We say that about green tea too. Don't mm -hmm. drink it with food. So there's that. All right, let's see what else do we have here. Nutritional yeast and Crohn's disease. So mm -hmm. Um, this is kind of interesting. People with Crohn's disease tend to have more antibodies to yeast, and that's all yeast across the board. And their, but their white blood cells also overreact to yeast because their system is hypersensitive. Um, even the, the dead yeast that can be found in typical foods, because you know some foods just have yeast on them because that's a thing, especially like fruits and stuff. They just do. Um, and people with Crohn's disease are really sensitive to that. Um, some vaccines have yeast in them on purpose to purposefully heighten the immune response um, because your body it, reacts to it. Yeah, it helps your body say, oh, pay attention, this is an invader, and learn to deal with it. Um, but then the question becomes, is there a risk for creating autoimmune disease by giving the system too much of a, a boost? And we've talked about that before, that if you overboost your immune system, you end up with, um, with autoimmune diseases, which is a problem. And, you know, it, Crohn's is a genetic disease. It passes from families. So there is some question of, is it possible that we're over, 
stimulating them and that's causing a problem. So the interesting thing is that, so the question was, does yeast cause Crohn's or does Crohn's cause um, a sensitivity to yeast? And they did a whole bunch of studies back and forth and they couldn't really, they couldn't find a correlation that went like a causation. They could find correlation, there's correlation there. They couldn't find causation as to which way it went. So then they thought, well, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's something else that's causing both of these things to um, be stimulated in the body. So then they asked about um, candida, which is the yeast that causes uh, thrush and vaginal yeast infections. It turns out that it's a perfectly normal part of gut flora, that the can, candida is actually part of the, the lower colon GI tract, but it doesn't seem to be the cause of it either, that, that that's just there. Um, there's an interesting note as I went through this, this research that um, a lot of people go on these low candida diets and they, they talk about how sugar feeds um, yeast and so they shouldn't have sugar, but um, candida is so far down in your colon that sugar wouldn't get there anyway. Your body would have absorbed it before it got there. And so it's actually a little bit dangerous, these low candida diets, because they put people on these foods saying, well, don't feed the, 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 the yeast in your, in your colon, but the colon is so far down that anything that would usually feed a yeast is gone. So mm. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. How are we doing on time? Oh, I put my glasses on and I can't see. Oh, we're all running out of time. Have to hurry. Zoom, zoom. All right, what else do I have here? Oh, I wanted to talk about lead and hot sauce. Oh, yes. Did you, did you read, read that article? article? Yeah. So, as you guys know, Russ lives, Loves on, his hot sauce. He lives on Tabasco, basically. I think that's all the man eats. But what they were saying was that chilies and things that are imported from Mexico are very high in lead. And that it, it could either be because the ground just has a lot of lead in it and the plants absorb yeah. it. That's possible. It could also be that it's added to the food as something that makes stuff heavy. They also said it could be in the air. Could be in the air. Right. Yeah, we've talked a lot about how lead can be, is pretty ubiquitous. Um, the article talked about how apparently there's, there was some lead poisoning because one marijuana shipper was adding lead, little lead pellets to their marijuana bags to make them heavier because lead is very heavy, and that was causing a problem. So, you know, don't smoke marijuana that has lead in yeah, it. It's right. not ideal. Yeah. Um, but anyway, back to lead and hot sauce. If your hot sauce is imported from Mexico or is made from chilies that are imported from Mexico, it could be something that you need to be concerned about, something to, to look at. So that if you have hot sauce in the house, look at, you know, where is it made and where the chilies come from. Um, you said Tabasco seemed to be fine. It's, Tabasco seems to be fine. Okay, and then sriracha, I think, comes from... Mexico. Does it come from Mexico? I think Mexico? that's a Mexican brand, yeah. Yeah, so you look at your hot sauces, see where they come from, might be something to consider. The interesting thing is there's no FDA level of lead safety for hot sauces. There are for candies, because apparently some candies mm -hmm. have peppers and stuff in them. Yeah. So there's a level of lead, what, you know, what's considered safe. Um, lead for candy, but not for hot sauce. So hot sauces aren't tested for lead. So I can't even say to you, look under your packaging or you know, reach out to the manufacturer. Yeah. They don't measure. Just it. find out where things are sourced and where they manufacture it. Yeah. Because um, they couldn't even tell if it's happening. Would you say they said it was in the chilies? Chilies, yeah. No, because I didn't. I guess I missed that part because I, I was under the impression they really couldn't tell what the source was. The one that I saw said that chilies from Mexico tend to be high in lead and they, that's where they talked about was it in the soil, is it in the air, where is it coming from, why is it there. So something to consider especially if you are pregnant, want to become pregnant or are lactating because uh, lead is a very um, toxic. It's toxic mm. and it crosses it crosses the placenta. It also goes into breast milk. So it is, if you are uh, using hot sauce from Mexico and you either want to become pregnant, are pregnant, or are breastfeeding, I would recommend you probably stop using mm. that hot sauce just because of the risk of lead. Which, for adults, you know, uh, we've told you, it get, our, our bodies are pretty good at storing it in our bones, which is fine until you get osteoporosis and your body starts excreting it. Mm. But for adults, it's, it's pretty much okay. But... For, um, for lactating or pregnant women, it's, yeah. it's going to be a problem. And children, obviously. Well, yes, and children. Uh, you know, how, ma how much hot sauce children eat is debatable, but again, look to see if it's from Mexico, because that's kind of the, the thing. 
Um, I also wanted to tell all of you that we got ourselves a gym. We are a little yes. gym for our basement. We're super happy about it. Now, I, I, silly me, I made a mistake. I thought that having a home gym meant we would go to the gym less. No, turns out it means we're doing two a days. <laughs> two a days. I thought I was past my my time of doing two a days, but apparently. You gotta get ready for you know camp. Is that what we're getting ready for? Getting ready for bikini season if it yes. ever comes, if we're ever allowed out of the house again. So that's all I had for them. I did want to show them Nebby's new trick. Okay. If she'll come here. Nebby, come here. Where are you, hon? Come here. Oh, here come here, comes. little. Tail wagon. Here she comes. Here she So that's another reason I have on this silly vest. She might have been napping, so just make sure she's awake. Are up. you awake? Hmm? Are you awake? All right. Let's see if she'll do it. See if she'll do it. Off. Me, uh, Off step you away. move the chair. All right. Come here. You ready? Nebby, you ready? Are you awake? You ready? Ha! There you go. Good girl. That's our new trick. Isn't that the coolest thing ever? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so impressed with her. I am. Can you do down? Down? Yes. Good girl. Good girl. This is my little doggy. All right, hold on. Hold on. I'm going to get down so she doesn't have to jump far. Off. Good girl. Because she's still young, I don't like making her jump all the way from uh, my shoulders. Yes. But I apparently don't get low enough. I'm so proud of her for learning that. So cool. Good little dog. Good little dog. All right. Is that all you have for them? That's it. All right. Okay. So with that, we'll say eat real food. Mostly, mostly plants. plants. Have a great night, guys. Have a good one. We'll see you next month. Stay warm.